So thank you for coming tonight. Uh, you have to really be a hardcore art lover, I guess, to come out on a night like this. Um, Joan, thanks for having me back. We're thrilled. Okay. And we're videotaping you, too. Okay, very good. Okay, so artists avoiding censorship. This is, uh, of course, an issue that's been going on throughout history. Uh, but the focus of this talk tonight is how artists cope with censorship, how they find clever ways to get around censors. Um, this talk, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, is uh, a result of another talk I do on Picasso uh, in, uh, during the war years in occupied Paris and how he managed to not only survive but create art under extremely diverse circumstances um, and how he was able to develop a kind of coded visual language to avoid uh, being killed by the Nazis, essentially. That's a whole other talk. But So tonight, this talk also deals with that issue. Is how the, uh, we're going to look at a group of artists, starting from the Renaissance and going right up to today, and how artists are still fighting these issues of censorship and how they're finding ways around it, sometimes at great personal or professional risk. So I'm going to start here. With uh, this artist, Paolo Veronese. Now, Veronese was active in the late Renaissance in Venice, and he was a, a mannerist. He um, was part of an art movement that it was experimenting with exaggeration and um, stretching the boundaries of what was acceptable in Italian art, Italian painting. He's still a, a controversial figure uh, in that. Some scholars see him as a technical master, but a rather vapid personality, and that his work didn't really have a lot of content. Others see him as an important artist, one of the first artists that truly fought for artistic freedom uh, against the Catholic Church. So uh, this painting, Wedding at Cana, is a good example of how Veronese handled religious themes from his commissions from the church. <clears throat> and we see here, uh, when in Cana is where uh, Christ it performs his first miracle. He turns water into wine. And here we see how Veronese has taken this serious religious theme and put it in the context of a party, a banquet in his contemporary Venice. And this is actually... This would be a party that Veronese himself would attend, something just like this. And in fact, he's included himself in this painting. He's uh, part of this group of musicians, the one uh, playing with the bow in the front there. That's a self-portrait. He's also included, I think, uh, Titian or Tintoretto, and a number of other artists and notable figures from, from that period, people that he knew. So... Um, he was really stretching the boundaries here. He was really outside already of what the Roman Catholic Church was comfortable with. Well, the after, what's the approximate year of this? This was, okay, this was, uh, he painted this in 1563. And you have to remember that the Inquisition was still going on in 1563. So to violate the church's uh, restrictions was very, very risky. Part of the reason he had gotten away with it to this point is that he was working in Venice. If he had been working in Rome, he wouldn't have gotten away with it. Venice at the time, depending on who you asked, was either the most progressive nation state in Italy or the most decadent. So they were on another level, and they were removed enough from Rome that Veronese could get away with more. But they were watching him, and they were very, very upset by these types of paintings that he was doing. Um, now, with the unveiling of this commission that he had from the church, his um, version of the Last Supper, which was unveiled in 1573, he finally gets in trouble with the church. Um, <clears throat> in this painting, which is an enormous painting, it's, um, I think, over 30, 30 feet long, almost 40 feet long by 15 feet. <clears throat> Excuse me. And... Um, the church is very upset with the fact that Veronese has included a number of inappropriate figures in this composition. And again, he's placed it in the context of his contemporary Venice. It's no longer 
in the uh, traditional setting, he's transposed it as another kind of party dinner scene in Venice. One of the, the uh, things that got Veronese in trouble here, he put, he put beasts directly in front of Christ. If you can see, there's a cat underneath the table teasing the dog right in front of Jesus. They were deeply offended by this. And some of the figures are even distracted by these animals. Um, another thing that they didn't like, he included, again, figures like this jester. Now, this jester is probably somebody he knew from these palatial affairs that he attended, but it was totally inappropriate for the, this serious painting of the Last Supper. The, the church elders could not figure out what he was thinking. They had no idea what he was trying to do. Um, he also included Hessian guards, German guards. And, you, and at the time, the uh, Roman Catholic Church was not on good terms with Germany. The Reformation movement was coming out of Germany with Martin Luther. And this really put them over the top. They could not understand why he included German guards. Now, <clears throat> some, some see this as a um, clue that indeed Veronese was a sympathizer for the Reformation movement and was kind of making a dig at the Catholic Church with the inclusion of these German guards. Um, but at any rate, with this painting, Veronese becomes the first artist from the Renaissance to have to appear before the Inquisitors. And this is very serious, I don't have to tell you. If he's found guilty, he could be uh, imprisoned, tortured, or at worst case scenario, put to death for heresy. How can you tell that these oh. are German guards? Oh, no, they were, they were in the... They're, they're yeah. German guards. Yeah, okay. they're, I mean, I could, looking well, at that, I couldn't have interpreted well, it that way. No, they were German guards in the time. Okay. They were, uh, yeah. It was very identifiable. Okay. Very identifiable. The two figures in the forefront? Yes, or? yes, okay. yes. So, Veronese appears before the Inquisitors. <clears throat> and this is a really important uh, chapter in art history because uh, Veronese is probably the first artist on record who, uh, in, a, in, a, in a trial setting, takes the defense of artistic freedom. And Bernice makes the case that, um, as an artist in Italy, he's frustrated by the church's restrictions, and he feels, as a painter, he should have greater creative freedom to decide what he puts or doesn't put into a painting. He's careful to, to um, reassure the church, the inquisitors, that he didn't mean to insult the church, he wasn't against the church, but it was his creative interpretation of this scene, and that was his explanation. Um, he also argues, as others had before him, including Michelangelo, that painters should not be regarded as mere artisans. That's what they were... Painters in Italy during the Renaissance were considered basically tradesmen. Uh, they were not on the same level as uh, philosophers or poets, uh, actors, and even Michelangelo had fought very hard to overcome that uh, stereotype and argue that painters were on the highest level. And Veronese continues that argument. He makes that argument. But another interesting part of his defense... Um, he brings up Michelangelo, and he points out how inappropriate Michelangelo's last judgment was. And uh, in fact, when Michelangelo's last judgment had been unveiled at the Sistine Chapel, it, it caused great controversy within the Catholic Church. And many of the church elders at the time wanted it removed or changed. And it was only because of the support of uh, Pope Paul III that uh, Michelangelo prevailed, and the Last Judgment was left as he painted it um, until... Yes, do you have a question? Weren't some of the figures originally completely nude? No, I was going yeah. oh, oh, okay. to mention yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, the original, um, the original version, that's absolutely right, um, that Michelangelo painted, most of the male figures were nude. There was frontal nudity, 
Uh, and in fact, Michelangelo had even interpreted Christ as this kind of buff, muscular stud, and even put Christ in a very provocative pose. So this was really controversial, and it really, uh, it, the fact that it was left untouched was pretty amazing. However, uh, a footnote here, not shortly after Michelangelo died, and after Pope Paul III had died, they immediately changed it, and that's the last judgment that we all know. So, <clears throat> any rate, so Ferenisi makes this point. He says, if, he, if Michelangelo could get away with it, why are you, you know, getting on my case, more or less? And uh, so the Inquisitors decide... Quick question about the last judgment. Were the only changes those little coverings on... Basically, yeah, the loincloths. Yeah, mo that's pretty much it. Yeah. So, you know, when they cleaned the Sistine Chapel, like, 20 years ago, why didn't they get rid of them? I can't answer that question. I don't know if you could, it's that easy. I don't know if you could just remove that one layer and that the other layer would be intact. I don't know what they did. I'm not, that's beyond my level of knowledge. I'm not sure if that could have been restored. It's a good question. Yes. Were there writings about what it originally looked like? There's actually one painting in existence that uh, an Italian painter did. I forget his name. I think he was a student at the time. And he did, as a study, do a painting of The Last Judgment, and that painting... The original. Right, and that painting uh, survived. So we have that as the only reference to how it originally looked. Um, the other question I have here, which I don't have an answer to at this point, I'm trying to do a little research, additional research myself. I'd be curious, because this was unveiled in 1573, and Michelangelo died, I think, in 1564, something like that. So had the, had the Last Judgment already been altered by the time Veronese was making this defense? Uh, I don't no. know. It's no. an interesting question. I was going to look into that. But there, uh, there aren't the right number of disciples. There are. There are some hidden. In there fact, uh, if I go back here, uh, I can show you one thing which is interesting. <clears throat> oh, hold on. Yeah, you see in this panel, if you look between those two columns mm -hmm. on the upper left, he actually has one of the apostles um, picking his teeth. So these are the kind of things that Veronese would just throw in and uh, got them really in an uproar. Um, Could you tell us, like, what in that painting makes it mannerable? Okay, yeah, I can. Hold on. Sorry, I'm trying to get ahead of here. Apologize. Uh, yes, um, as I said before, in a very general way, uh, uh, artists from the early Renaissance were more concerned with realism and uh, portraying everything in a very noble, appropriate way. They had very rigid standards of beauty. The mannerists were playing with that. They were getting beyond traditional uh, classic perspective. They were flattening out space differently. Uh, they were doing things for dramatic effect. They were heightening colors. The Venetian painters used a completely uh, more brilliant palette. Um, and they were playing with composition. They were intentionally doing things, like throwing things in that didn't belong. And many of their compositions are intentionally asymmetrical. Uh, so they were, exper they were experimenting. Um, so anyhow, I don't want to... So, uh, once again, I'm, I'm forgetting the outcome of this. I apologize. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Just to sum this up, sorry. So the Inquisitors come to the following conclusion. They tell Veronese he has to make all the changes that they want. He has to eliminate all these controversial figures. And, of course, Veronese agrees to it. But time passes, about a year passes, and um, the church <coughs> inquires what's going on, and Veronese has not changed anything. And what Veronese does, he goes back to the church and he says, I changed the name of the painting. It's no longer called The Last Supper. It's called <laughs> Feast in the House of Levy. So, therefore, I don't have to change anything. And he gets away with this. 
Now, it's not really, we don't know how he got away with that exactly. Maybe because, again, it was in Venice and there was more leniency, but he does get away with this, and the painting is still in existence, as is. Where is so, it? it's in a monastery uh, in Venice. Um, now I'm going to switch gears here and go to the next, fit, next artist I want to talk about, um, Bill Trailer. And we're going to jump here to um, post-Civil War America, the Restoration period, and um, Bill Trailer. Uh, I first came across Bill's work in, I was at a show in New York, uh, I think it was one of the um, Outsider Artist uh, Festival shows, and I saw this little piece. I had never heard of Bill Trailer, didn't know who he was. And this, this painting was the painting I saw. It was on a small piece of cardboard. And it, I had an immediate visceral reaction to this painting. I, had no, I have no idea why. There was a certain power, a certain energy to his work that I, th I thought was amazing. And that's when I started to realize and look into this artist and find out what an amazing story this is. Um, why is that? There, so I'm just going to go on to this. Uh, Bill Trailer was a um, he was born a slave, and he was about 12 years old when the Emancipation Proclama Proclamation was signed, and he uh, remained as a farmhand on the plantation where he had been a slave for many years. He raised a family on that plantation because he was, like uh, most former slaves, illiterate. He had never been allowed to have any education, so. Many of these people were still kind of stuck. He eventually moved on to be a tenant farmer, where he raised, I think, a second family. And by the time he was close to 70 years old, he decides he's had enough, and he makes his way to Montgomery, which is the nearest big city. And uh, he finds work in a shoe factory. And he remains working at that shoe factory for many years until it closes, I think, because of the uh, Great Depression. It's tied into the Great Depression. At that point, He's in his late 70s, and he's homeless. So this is a historic photograph from uh, Montgomery, and this is Monroe Street. This is the, the neighborhood that Bill Trailer lived in, and suddenly, we don't know why, and when he was uh, in his early 80s, starts making art on the street. He finds he has a regular place he goes to every day, which is the porch of a general store, and he becomes very known as a local artist, and he tries to sell his paintings for coins. And he um, is allowed to sleep in the back room of a funeral parlor. And he, over the period of about four years, he um, completes about a thousand paintings and drawings, which we only have, uh, only survived because of another artist who became aware of Bill Trailer and saved his. Uh, body of work from destruction, Charles Shannon. Um, but, uh, oh, this is, yeah, this is a photograph of Bill working on this porch of this general store. He was there almost every day. And, again, we don't know if he had drawn or painted when he was young. We have no record of that. But it was really as if he had very little time, and it was very important for Bill Trailer to, for us to understand what he was seeing. He was, he was witnessing things, and he wanted to leave a testimony of the things that he was living through. Um, as I said, he painted mostly uh, on cardboard. So he would find discarded cardboard items like soap boxes, uh, various, whatever it was, and flatten them out and paint on the back side of these uh, items. So he always worked on cardboard. Um, so this is a typical Bill Trailer painting that for decades had been interpreted as naive folk art. Uh, he was kind of put in the same category as Grandma Moses, as someone who had started to paint late in life and painted these kind of charming, innocent scenes of the countryside. Um, this is another example of some of Bill's paintings. Again, these were viewed for decades as innocent farm, you know, farm animals and people he was looking at the streets of Montgomery. 
It wasn't until our 2011 when an Israeli uh, scholar, art scholar, came out with a, a work on Bill Trailer, uh, Michelle Sobel. I actually have the book here if anybody's interested after the talk. And uh, Ms. Sobel came up with a new theory on Trailer's work, which is the prevalent, the, the dominant theory now about his work. And that is that he was not, he was far more than a naive folk artist. And that what he had been doing, he developed a complete coded visual language to be able to, to express what he was really feeling, which was <coughs> tremendous rage and fear as a black man living in Jim Crow America. Um, so if we look at, uh, here again is one of these paintings. He has a lot of figures that are pointing. And what uh, Sobel argues is that Again, these are, this is a visual uh, reference to figures bearing witness to something that they want us to see. So you'll see these pointed figures over and over in Bill's uh, paintings. Um, but it goes, as you can see from this detail from a painting, it goes way beyond naive folk art. He um, paints a lot of dogs, and in this detail, you can see how terrified Bill Trailer was of dogs because dogs were trained uh, to attack African Americans in the Deep South, and they were also used to track down uh, escaped slaves. He had a tremendous fear of dogs. You can see here's another one of these where he's made this dog. You can see he, he, people again thought this was naive art. Why is the dog so big? figure so small. Well, this is very intentional on, on Trailer's part. He's making the dog large to make it more turn. monstrous and, and revealing his figures about these, his feelings about these dogs. This one, you can see, this for decades was interpreted as um, depicting a young white boy walking his dog through the streets of Montgomery, but now we realize it's probably not a boy at all. It's a white man, it's an adult. But he's, the trailer has made the dog enormous so that we feel how threatened uh, he was by these animals. Um, there's another example here, you see. Uh, this the central figure is caught in the middle of all this going on. He's holding a, a flask, using alcohol to numb his fear, his anxiety. And on top, there's this enormous black bird perched, crushing right on his head. Well, so Bell argues that the black birds that he uses over and over in his imagery are just symbols for Jim Crow. And it's literally showing us how Jim Crow was just crushing uh, blacks in the Deep South. And, Again, on the lower right, we have this attack, this vicious attack dog. And on the left, we have, again, it could be interpreted as an innocent farm implement, or it can be used for far darker purposes. Now, this, this painting, this drawing done, um, on the bottom, we have the Jim Crow symbol again. And above it, we have a spotted leopard. So here, Trailer's making a specific reference to his African heritage. And in African culture, leopards, lions, tigers, these are symbols of power, aggression. Um, and he's showing us this snow, this snow, this spotted leopard with his teeth bared uh, in juxtaposition with this, with Jim Crow. And we can uh, surmise what's going to happen to Jim Crow. Now, what sparked this uh, painting on. It's a very interesting story. There was a circus that had come to town, had come to Montgomery, and they posted uh, posters uh, all throughout town. And they posted one of these posters uh, right behind Bill, where he worked, on the general store. And it so offended him that he flipped it around and painted this image. This was the poster. So, again, we see that this was not innocent folk art that he was really trying to express himself uh, without getting killed. Uh, one of his sons had been lynched. This was a man with tremendous rage and fear. 
Um, this one last image of Bill's work. Uh, later, in, at, when he was in his late 80s, he lost a leg, probably to diabetes, I'm not certain. And this is a very moving image to me. He's, again, bearing witness to something he feels is important. And it's probably the first time he saw an, an airplane. Uh, and you think when this man had been born and what he had seen through the course of his life, this was an amazing event for him. Uh, kind of a happy note or a, good, a positive note at the end of the story. Bill now is, uh, Bill Trailer is one of the most important American artists. He recently had a one-person show at the Smithsonian. Uh, and I was at the Whitney last year when it opened, the new Whitney. And uh, I was pleased to see, I snapped this picture. I was pleased to see a Bill Trailer. They have Bill Trailers included in their collection now of important American artists. And this year, his unmarked grave was uh, given a uh, plaque and a kind of a memorial. His whole family, all of his descendants attended. So he's really become recognized, and his work did survive. I'm going to jump here now to another part of this talk, which is science fiction and how science fiction has always been throughout history a safe haven for artists trying to um, address political dissent. And um, this is the Martian Chronicles, Ray Bradbury. This is published in 1950. And uh, by the way, this came out before Fahrenheit 451. Fahrenheit 451, I think, was published in 1953. When this was published in 1950, um, Bradbury was a young writer. He didn't realize until many years later he didn't find out that he had been under surveillance by the FBI. They thought that because of McCarthyism, they thought that this was an anti-American work, that he was a communist, and he was trying to um, get this anti-American message spread through science fiction that they didn't think, uh, he didn't think they would catch him. So even science fiction is not always as safe as writers think. Uh, and um, it's quite amazing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Bradbury. Yeah, so he was very amazed by this whole thing. He had no idea he was being... Uh, monitored, they were following him, watching him, they had a huge dossier on him. They couldn't find anything. Uh, it was all nonsense. Um, another science fiction writer, Heinlein, Robert Heinlein, was using science fiction to, uh, to write about uh, McCarthyism. Thinly veiled criticism of McCarthyism, he used science fiction. Um, and these, are, these originally ran in the, in the science fiction pulp magazines before they were published as books. This science fiction writer is mostly forgotten, uh, little known. Her name is Judith Merrill. And she was the, one of the first women, maybe like one of two, that managed to break into the male-dominated world of science fiction in New York. And she was one of the few women who were published. Who their, their science fiction work was published. She was way ahead of writers like uh, Ursula K. Le Guin and Margaret Atwood. And uh, it's a miracle that she even got published. She was one of the first, maybe the first science fiction writer in America that dealt with uh, feminist science fiction. Her central characters in her stories were always women. And the publishers at the time thought that there was absolutely no market for science fiction that was about women. And they were probably right. There probably wasn't. But she managed to get through um, first in the pulps. <clears throat> and you can see what she was dealing with. Most of the science fiction at the time were so-called you know, space westerns or space operas, which featured heroic white male characters. And women were usually just you know, women in distress being rescued by the men. Uh, even though they might be in outer space, they usually have bikinis on. So, <laughs> so you can see she had an article here, uh, Barrier of Dread, Judith Merrill, which probably was completely out of context with the rest of these stories, but she managed to get them published here and there. Um, and she started to publish a couple of novels, and they, again, they always featured women as the central characters. Uh, she went on to become a very important science fiction editor, 
in the 1960s, and this book, uh, which was also published in the early 1960s, Daughters of Earth, was maybe the first collection of science fiction stories uh, that each story had a, a female as its central character. And these were fully developed characters, uh, from heroines to villains. And uh, again, this was way before uh, Atwood or any of these other writers. In fact, I'll just say as quickly as a footnote to this. Uh, Merrill wound up uh, leaving the United States in protest of not no, McCarthyism, but the uh, United States' role in Vietnam. And she wound up living the rest of her life in Toronto. And that's where she, actually Atwood heard about her. And Atwood actually did know of Merrill and was very uh, taken with her. And they actually did have a, a, a friendship. I don't know how deep it went, but they, Atwood did know about Merrill. Now, anybody recognize this young writer? Rod Serling. Okay, Rod Serling. It's amazing. People, everybody knows Rod Serling. Um, Rod Serling uh, started out in Cleveland, Ohio, as a writer. He actually grew up in um, which town upstate? Now I'm forgetting. Oh, he grew up in upstate New York, and the town is slipping me right now. But he wound up uh, coming back from the war uh, and settling in Cleveland. He had fought as a paratrooper. He saw heavy action in the Philippines. And Serling came back, like most people who served in the war, deeply affected by what he had experienced. And he, uh, he really had this desire to pursue a writing career after the war. He had been encouraged by his high school teacher. And he had really a special talent. And he decides with his young wife to settle in New York and try to break into radio and this new medium called television. Um, so from the get-go, Serling is very uh, conscious of social issues in America, and that's what he wants to write about. He wants to be a social critic. He breaks into television in New York, along with another young writer, Patty Chayofsky, and by 1955, Serling gets his big break. He writes a script, a teleplay, uh, for a live television production. Uh, I think it was on Craft Television, uh, Craft Television Theater in 1955. And the teleplay is called Patterns. And this show, which you can watch on YouTube, uh, dealt with age discrimination in American corporate culture in 1955. And it was an overnight sensation. Millions of Americans watched it. The network got uh, uh, significant positive feedback on this show. And o literally overnight, Serling's the most important American writer for television, along with Chayofsky. A year later, he does this teleplay called uh, The Arena, which is a critique of the Senate. And this is where, by 1956, Serling starts to experience extreme censorship by the networks and the sponsors. He wants to write these critical uh, looks at problems in America, issues in America, and the networks are very nervous about it, as are the sponsors. So uh, the sponsors and the networks uh, have the right, uh, a final script uh, sign-off. They can make changes. Uh, and they do. And Serling begins to get very uh, upset by the amount of censorship that he experiences. Um, he, he's quoted as saying, uh, let me just say this quickly here, it's worth repeating. Serling is quoted as saying after this was broadcast, he says, in retrospect, I probably would have had a much more adult play had I made it science fiction, put it in the year 2057, and people to send it with robots. So there's, also, there's already this feeling that he can't work creatively in this uh, genre of commercial television. Um, in 1958, he writes a script based on the murder of uh, Emmett Till. And the networks, he already has a reputation. They're very afraid of what he's going to come up with. 
and they basically um, make him remove all references to blacks in his script. So they change, he has to change the whole setting to a Mexican village, uh, and every player is white except for the, the, the guy that's charged with the, um, the attack on a, on a woman, a white woman, who's a Mexican farmhand. It's changed to a Mexican farmhand instead of a black guy. And the, the real uh, person responsible is played by a young William Shatner here. So again, uh, I think Sterling's quoted as saying, by the time my script was aired, my script had turned to dust. <laughs> and he's so frustrated at this point by the censorship. Chayofsky had already left television. He, he feels it's inherently impossible to do serious drama on commercial television. And he leaves for, for film. And... Uh, He's still relevant. You know which production are doing now of Chayofsky. Does anybody know? On Broadway? Network. Network is Patty Chayofsky. Of course. And now it's more important than ever. And they're two very important, interesting American writers. Um, a year later, 1959, Sterling does a, the first teleplay of the Holocaust, about the Holocaust for television and about the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. He'd already done a, um, a teleplay on the Korean War called The Rack, which had been very popular. And so they, they, have to, they have to air his scripts. He's very in demand. But again, there's such censorship and compromise. Unfortunately for Serling, the sponsor, this was Playhouse 90, and the, and the sponsor for Playhouse 90 when he wrote uh, Judgment Nuremberg for television happens to be the American Gas Association. <laughs> so the American Gas Association read this script, and they're terrified that they're going to be associated with the, you know, with, yeah. So they force Serling to omit every reference to gas, gas ovens, everything. And uh, this is really the straw that breaks the camel's back for Serling. He realizes he cannot go on like this. Um, and this is why Serling comes up with the concept for the Twilight Zone. Like many writers before him, he realizes that the only way he's going to be able to effectively uh, criticize society, his, his government, is by guising it, disguising it within the context of science fiction fantasy. And that's really why he came up with the Twilight Zone. And many of the episodes on The Twilight Zone uh, deal with themes that he wanted to deal with as straight drama, nonfiction, but he knew he couldn't. This episode from the first season is called, no, it's from the fourth season. <coughs> it's called He Lives. This is a young Dennis Hopper. And uh, the, the, it's basically about a young uh, tyrant who um, wants to rise to power in the shadow of Hitler. Uh, and uh, this is post-war America this takes place in. And he's not very good at it. So he begins to be coached by this mysterious figure that visits him at night. And it's, unveil it's revealed at the end of the episode that, of course, that figure is the spirit of Hitler. And there's another twist with his elderly Jewish friend who's a survivor. I won't, I won't give you that spoiler. But... Again, this is an example. Certainly couldn't have written this as straight drama. It would not have been aired. But at least he got something said. Um, this is another interesting episode. It's called The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street from the first season. And this is a clever way that uh, Serling talks about McCarthyism and what, uh, uh, what polit how politicians using fear can turn people against each other. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> what do you know? I'm sorry. I said, "What do you know?" Why, yeah. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so this takes place in a very idyllic American suburban community, and they suddenly feel there's this external threat. It, he uses aliens as the as the threat instead of McCarthyism or whatever, and suddenly these neighbors are turning against each other and suspecting each other of being spies for this invader. And one person's eventually killed, an innocent person's eventually killed, and you get the idea. So he does this over and over again. And this is his way, again, he couldn't have written this 
as a straight criticism of McCarthyism or how he felt about some American politicians. He was very nervous, certainly was very nervous that America could go fascist. He was very concerned about that. Um, this episode is called uh, uh, Nice Place to Visit. And uh, this was done also in the first season. It's about a petty crook who is uh, killed in the course of a robbery. And he suddenly is uh, guided by this, this angelic figure. Um, and he gains the ability to get whatever he wants. Whatever he wants, he gets it. In his case, it's money, uh, great apartment, fancy apartment, and, and uh, voluptuous women, you know? Uh, the twist at the end is that it's not heaven. It actually turns out to be hell because this character realizes that getting whatever you want becomes very boring and it actually becomes uh, a punishment in a strange way. The reason I mention this episode tonight, Donald Trump is a fan of the original Twilight Zone. This is his favorite episode. <laughs> Interesting, right? You should watch it. You, it's very revealing. I mean, it's, it's, it's available on Netflix. You should watch it. <clears throat> so now I'm jumping here to New York in the 1970s. I'm talk a little bit, jump into street art. Um, we tend to forget how aggressive uh, street artists were in the 1970s. And uh, certain subway lines were completely covered inside and out with graffiti. The, the city was in bad economic <laughs> shape. And there were many alienated minorities. And this was their way of lashing out. Uh, much of the Lower East Side was covered in graffiti. And it was really a, a real problem for the city at the time. It was, uh, this argument was going on, was it vandalism, was it art? Well, it was both. And um, in most cases, it, it was not great art, I would say, but great art came out, some great art came out of it, interestingly enough, this language of graffiti. Um, most famous artist that came out of the street art movement, graffiti art, was, of course, Basquiat, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, along with Keith Haring, who I don't have time to talk about tonight. But Basquiat, uh, by the 1990s, he was a teenager. Uh, he, I think he had dropped out of school at this point. He was basically homeless, and he connects to this graffiti art scene. And um, I should probably know, it's not until a little later that he meets Andy Warhol, and his fortunes change, and he becomes one of the most in-demand artists in America, actually becoming part of what he originally protested against, which was the art establishment in New York, which as a young man who was half Haitian and half Puerto Rican, didn't, knew he didn't have a chance in breaking into the legitimate art world. Um, but his work, I just want to spend a couple of minutes here, much like Trailer's work, deals with these, again, these themes of Jim Crow. And, uh, you know, Basquiat is using... Uh, in the spirit of graffiti art, he's using words and language to get our attention, repeating things over and over again. Um, these are very powerful. And like Trailer, uh, Basquiat's not using traditional material. He's not painting on stretched canvas. He's finding objects on the streets of New York, discarded doors, windows, panels, and painting on whatever he finds. It's very non-traditional art. He's using house paints. Whatever he has. Um, and uh, it's very interesting. And, and Basquiat had a number of uh, folk heroes, American folk heroes, that he wanted to really um, honor. And he uses this visual symbol of the crown over and over again to, to, to honor people that he felt were important American heroes. This, of course, is Dizzy Gillespie, one of his uh, heroes, and uh, another... Interesting piece, I like this, is uh, Joe Lewis. This piece is actually called St. Joe Lewis, Surrounded by Snakes. You get the point. Basquiat's not always subtle. So, <laughs> But uh, again, this is painted on, I think, a door. Uh, and uh, very powerful. And of course, has the cartoonish quality of graffiti art. Another one of 
Basquiat's big folk heroes was, was Muhammad Ali, the greatest of them all. And in this painting, uh, he honors Ali with portraying Ali as a bull in the ring. And um, Basquiat also uses this uh, visual symbol of a cow or a steer uh, in different ways. Here he's using it as a heroic symbol for Ali, but he al also uses it as a symbol of the meat market. You know, how cattle are sold, um, and he's using it as a not-so-subtle reference to slavery uh, in America, the history of slavery, how people were bought and sold like cattle. Um, and there's all kinds of messages and things going on in these with the language he's using. Um, this, we're going to jump here to Banksy, and this, this image by Banksy is actually a tribute to Basquiat. You see that he's taking Basquiat's crowns, mm -hmm. and he's making a reference to Banksy, uh, to Basquiat here. Banksy um, started uh, also in the, in the 1990s in England. Uh, some people believe he's from Birmingham, and that his name is Robert Cunningham. But they don't know for sure who Banksy is, as you probably all know. Um, and uh, Banksy started doing uh, paintings, graffiti art on the streets of, of London. This is a more recent piece of street art by Banksy. I don't know if you remember this. This was a few years ago where he uh, had this Ronald McDonald sculpture made. And every day it would appear at a different McDonald's location somewhere in one of the five boroughs with an actor who would spend all day uh, shining Ronald McDonald's shoes. And this was, a not, again, not so subtle statement about corporate power. And uh, Banksy was quoted as saying that Ronald McDonald is this, the um, second most sculpted figure in America, second only to Jesus Christ. <laughs> and uh, so this kind of this kind of elaborate street art, um, some people believe that Banksy is not one person, that Banksy is a collective of many artists. And something like this kind of does lead us to, in that direction because Banksy couldn't possibly produce all this art using all these different techniques. Um, it's, it's most likely a collective of artists working all over the world. Um, this I saw in New York. I don't know if you saw this. This was a few years ago. Uh, yeah, actually, this is maybe more than that, maybe closer to 10 years ago. He had this truck filled with stuffed pigs and cows, and there were, he had sound coming from the, these screeching animals. And he started out in the meat district, the meat packing district, and it was his statement against the, uh, for animal rights. And it was very effective. I saw it on 57th Street. Did you see it? Yes. You see? We remember these things. They're very powerful. Um, they become iconic. And again, did, did one person do this? The other thing I want to mention here quickly is that Banksy was the first uh, artist to really understand social media and how to use it. And he was the first artist that before he would do one of these events, he would announce it on social media. So all of his followers would see his Twitter, they would see his Facebook, and they would know what he was going to do before he did it and before the police knew. And uh, also, he was the first artist that used things like uh, social media, like YouTube to record his events, post them on YouTube, and they would go viral. And millions of people would see these, uh, the work that he did. Um, this is, again, one of his early pieces when he was starting out in London. Very, I think this is probably when Banksy was one person. They all have a very similar kind of British wit, and they have the same execution, the same style. But now it's much, much more than that. Again, another one of these early Banksy's painted on the wall in Israel. Very clever. They get your attention. Uh, and by the way, with pieces like this, he really kind of was taking great risk doing this. Uh, you could get killed if you're trying to do something like this. Um, this, again, is another reference to Basquiat. And this was when Basquiat was having a show at the Barbican, and Banksy was making fun of Basquiat saying what I had mentioned earlier, that Basquiat had actually become 
what he had protested against. He was sell his work was selling for millions and millions mm -hmm. of dollars. I mean, now it's up to like hundreds of millions of dollars. So he actually became exactly what he had protested against. This one I really like. This was uh, painted on a wall uh, in New Orleans after Katrina. And it's a homeless Abe Lincoln at this burned out uh, Holiday Inn. And I think it's a really clever statement on you know, how America has neglected the city. And, um, but some of his work is very, very clever, Banksy. Um, most recently, I don't know if any of you saw this. This is just like two months ago where a Banksy was being auctioned at Sotheby's, a uh, girl with a balloon, girl with a red balloon, and um, it sold for a million dollars. Immediately after it was announced that it was sold and someone had purchased it, something very strange happened. I'm going to show you right now if this it works. Ate, it ate itself. Let's we'll see. <laughs> see if this works. <laughs> Connoisseurs could only watch in horror as an expensive piece was shredded before their eyes. No sooner did the gavel come down to mark the sale of Banksy's Girl with Balloon for a record $1.4 million, did the picture start to slip out of its frame into shreds below. The anonymous artist claims to be behind the stunt. On Instagram, he posted a photo of his prank with the caption, Going, going, gone. In a later post, he explained how he did it. And it seems this stunt was years in the making. He claims he built the shredder into the painting's frame in case it ever sold at auction. <laughs> <laughs> Witnesses couldn't believe what they were seeing. We can only imagine what the buyer was thinking. The person's identity hasn't been revealed. Sotheby's claims it was shocked by the stunt. The auction house is also trying to figure out what this means for the value of the painting. <laughs> Considering the artist, who is known for using his craft to pull pranks and make ideological points, some artists speculate the value of Girl with Balloon could actually soar. For InsideEdition.com, I'm Marilyn Bono. So, a couple of interesting things about this. Um, one, again, you see a brilliant use of social media. He had someone there with a phone that filmed the whole thing. That was immediately posted on YouTube, immediately after this happened. And there were already, after in, in, within a matter of days, over two million people had watched that little video shot on a phone. <laughs> and yes, he's really brilliant. And um, also, it's not likely that Sotheby's did not know really? that this was. I, really? How could they handle that piece of art and not realize there was something peculiar? The way it was displayed was not how they normally auction a piece of work. So oh. something was going on with Sosa Bees as well, I think. Um, but uh, again, you see the brilliant use of social media. And that's where everything is now. Artists, young artists, are using social media uh, to get their message across. Um, this women's collective, does anybody recognize this group? This is a, a group of Russian women. They got together in 2011 protest Putin's government. Um, originally, yeah, I think there was 11. Um, they disguised themselves for obvious reasons, and they planned political, they were planning political theater, street art, that they were going to do, which was anti-Putin. You can imagine how risky this is. They called themselves Pussy Riot. And uh, in um, 2011, they did their first major perform piece of a performance art, street art, right in Red Square, right in front of the Kremlin. They, they, they performed an original song, punk rock song, which was anti-Putin. Um, and again, they used social media 
to promote the event to young people before it happened. The government didn't have a clue what was going on. They had enormous turnout, and this became, and they had phones there. So immediately after performance, it was posted on YouTube, social media, and went all over the world. And within days, millions and millions of young people had watched this performance. I have, this is a short, it's only about two minutes. This is the actual performance by Pussy Riot in Red Square. I hope you're not going to be, it's not too much for you. <laughs> something. What were you saying? To me, it looks like it's winter time. They're well, that's a, exactly right. This is a Russian winter. Right. And do you see how they're dressed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they're dressed for summer. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this was the first big performance art they did, and uh, the Russian government really didn't know how to react to this. Punk rock, rock did not exist in Russia before Pussy Riot. So it was completely through them they didn't know what to do. And they were immediately connecting with young people, immediately. Um, <clears throat> their next big uh, performance is a year later, 2012, where they go into the, um, the main Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow and go right up onto the altar, which is strictly forbidden for women. Which is complete male hierarchy, the Russian Orthodox Church. They go onto the altar and perform another original song called uh, Punk Prayer. And uh, they don't get very far. Within minutes, they're uh, arrested by security. Notice on those two tripods, they already have phones set up. So they're recording this. So this is already recorded. It goes on the internet immediately and goes viral. You can see here they're getting arrested and continuing to try to do this. Uh, this, just like Veronese, this gets them in trouble. They go against the Catholic Church, and this is too much. So now they're in big trouble, and they're put on trial. Uh, three of the women are. Two of the women, the two women on the right, wind up uh, being sentenced to two years in a, in a very bad prison. Uh, the, uh, these two women, uh, uh, Nadia uh, Tolakonakova is on the right, and uh, Masha uh, Alakina is on the left. Uh, Nadia is pretty much the leader of this movement now. Um, you see her here. She's like a cele she's a media celebrity now. She's known all over the world. She's uh, if you hear her speak when she's interviewed by journalists on television or whatever. Extremely articulate, brilliant person. Almost the antithesis of the music that they perform, which is really crude and de definitely can offend you very easily. Um, but she does two, her and uh, Masha do 
served two years doing hard time. And um, while they're in prison, there's a tremendous movement all over the world to get them released. This is a photograph of Madonna, mm -hmm. who was one of their big advocates to get them released and helped them get released, I think two months earlier, something like that. Um, and this year, they just finished a tour in the United States called Make America Great Again. <laughs> and it was an anti-Putin, anti-Trump uh, tour. And uh, I just want to say this quickly on this. Um, I know I'm running a little over here. I apologize. Um, you can't imagine the risk that these women, or you can't imagine yeah, the risk these women are taking. I don't even, I can't even imagine where they get their courage from. I, I can't even imagine it. And they've returned to Russia. They're in Russia now. Oh my gosh. Now, a recent update to this, to bring you right up to date. This, is, this took place uh, just this past October. Nadia's husband, Peter, was poisoned. Oh my. And he, when he was poisoned, he was working on a documentary about the journalist, the Russian journalist, who had been poisoned. So this was clearly a message sent out. He managed to survive. And he was, uh, they were going to put him in a, in a Russian hospital and his colleagues managed to get him out of the country because they knew if he went into a Russian hospital, that was it. They managed to get him out, and he's somewhere in Germany right now, uh, try, recovering, hopefully. So this is the risk these people are under, and uh, this is really up to the moment uh, street art, protest art that's going on, and uh, I mean, I don't know how I feel with my son or daughter being involved in something like this. It's truly frightening. Um, to tone it down a notch here to finish up, uh, this, this young woman, um, uh, Haley Gilmore from Starksville, Mississippi, this is a good example of how young people are using the internet to do pro political protest. Uh, Ms. Gilmore did this poster, designed this poster, which was used which she designed for the Women's March this year. And uh, this poster was uh, so popular that uh, it went viral, and people started to ask her, how can I get a copy of this poster? So if you go, she has a website now, and she actually, if you, for a small fee, she will, you can download a file, and you can print out your own copy of this image. And she donates a part of that small fee goes to women's causes. So this is a great example, I think, of you know, protest art that's being done now by young people. And all this imagery is, you know, sampled, I guess is the nice word of, way of putting it, uh, from popular culture. I didn't realize until recently that Princess Layla was such a feminist symbol. I had no idea. This is another uh, poster done by another young artist. What is the artist's name again? Haley, Haley Gilmore. Gilmore. Yeah, you can look it up. This this woman, uh, uh, Vanessa, is it Vanessa? I'm sorry. Let me just uh, Witter, uh, Veronica, Veronica Witter. I'm sorry. From L.A. Uh, again, came up with a similar image for a women's march, and uh, using Princess Layla and um, her her poster, which is really elegant, is is sampled. I'm being kind here again from another artist, Barbara Kruger, who was doing work in the 1990s. And she did these, she came up with this look of using black and white photography from advertising and popular culture and combining it with this typography in the red fields, a specific typeface. This is all ripped off from Barbara Kruger. This is a piece of Barbara Kruger's work in the 1990s. She had billboards all over the country, everything, uh, with uh, women's issues, dealing with women's issues. So what's interesting to me is that a lot of young women artists are still uh, referring to Barbara Kruger. That's, that's something that's very interesting. So um, you've been very patient. I'm going to wrap it up with a short video here, if it works. <laughs> Michael and 
Michelangelo to see you, Your Holiness. Who? Michelangelo, the famous Renaissance artist whose best-known works include the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and the celebrated statue of David. Very well. In 1514, he returned to Florence All and... All right, that's enough, that's enough. They've got it now. Oh. <laughs> Good evening, Your Holiness. Evening, Michelangelo. I want to have a word with you about this painting of yours, The Last Supper. Oh, yeah? I'm not happy about it. Oh, dear. It took me hours. I'm not happy at all. Is it the jello you don't like? <laughs> no. Nope. Oh, no, they do add a bit of colour, don't they? Oh, I know, you don't like the kangaroo. What kangaroo? No problem, I'll paint him out. I never saw a kangaroo. Uh, he's right at the back. I'll paint him out, no sweat, I'll make him into a disciple. Ah. <laughs> all right. That's the problem. What is? The disciples. Are they too Jewish? <laughs> I made Judas the most Jewish. No, it's just that there are 28 of them. Oh, well, another one will never matter. I'll make the kangaroo into another one. No, that's not the point. All right, well, I'll lose the kangaroo. Be honest, I wasn't perfectly happy with it. That's not the point. There are 28 disciples. Too many. Well, of course it's too many. <laughs> yeah, I know that, but I wanted to give the impression of a real Last Supper, you know, not just any old Last Supper. Not like a last meal or a final snack. But, you know, I wanted to give the impression of a real... Mother of a blowout, you know? <laughs> there were only 12 disciples at the Last Supper. Well, maybe some of the other ones came along. There were after only it. 12 altogether. Well, maybe some of their friends came by, you know? Look, there were just 12 disciples and our Lord at the Last Supper. The Bible clearly says so. No friends? No friends. Waiters? No. <laughs> Cabaret? No. You see, I like them. They help to flesh out the scene. I could lose Look, a few, you There know? were only 12 disciples. I've got it. I've got it. We'll call it the last but one supper. What? Well, there must have been one. If there was a last one, there must have been a one before that. So this is the penultimate supper. The Bible doesn't say how many people were there, now, does it? No. Well, no. they are, then. L Look, the last supper is a significant event in the life of our Lord. The penultimate supper was not... Even if they had a conjurer and a mariachi band. <laughs> now, a last supper I commissioned from you, and a last supper I want. With 12 disciples and one Christ. One? Yes, one. <laughs> now, will you please tell me what in God's name possessed you to paint this with three Christs in it? <laughs> it works, mate. Works? Yeah. It looks great. The fat one balances the two skinny ones. There was only one Redeemer. I know that. We all know that. What about a bit of artistic license? Well, one Messiah is what I want. I'll tell you what you want, mate. You want a bloody photographer. That's what you want. Not a bloody creative I'll artist. I'll tell you what out. I want. I want a Last Supper with one Christ, 12 disciples, no kangaroos, no trampoline acts by Thursday lunch or you don't get paid. Bloody fascist. Look, I'm the bloody Pope, I am! may not know much about art, but I know what I like. This was Monty Python's commentary on Veronese yeah, uh -huh. and The Last Supper, but they felt that more, more, not enough people would understand or identify with Veronese, so they changed it to Michelangelo. Anyhow, that's it for tonight. Thank you. Any questions at all? Anything at all? Yes, questions? Questions? Yes, there is. Get asked. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Just to play devil's advocate sure. for a minute. Here. Sure. Um, the, at the beginning, you talked about Veronese, and you mentioned you sort of I don't know I sort of heard that there there were commissions. Were all these paintings commissions? Mm -hmm. No, there wasn't a Renaissance artist that existed that didn't survive they didn't have a patron. on church commissions. That's Okay, That's so in other words, if someone's buying something and they're ordering it from you, isn't it? Doesn't it seem sensible that they can dictate what the content is? I, I mean, that's a that's a reasonable objection. I can't. Uh, I mean, if he's yeah. going to raise his own money to yeah. paint, he can paint whatever he wants, right? Yeah. I mean, I've got. I can't believe I'm defending the Catholic Church here, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I mean, it well, seems reasonable. He would, he would, to I guess you would argue though that uh, they're hiring him, right? And if they hire him. It goes with his judgment. When they, when Michelangelo did the Last Judgment, he certainly wasn't giving them what they thought they were going to get. 
Right. But is that uh, really censorship? Um, I think they, that what Veronese, I, again, I'm not going to, I don't want to, I can't, I don't know what Veronese was thinking, but I would argue that he's saying that uh, he, they wanted greater, greater creative interpretation of these religious themes, that they felt it was too narrow. And this was going on at the, at the time of re the Reformation movement, right. which was arguing for a looser, more inventive way of interpreting uh, religion that uh, would bring more people into it. They were becoming more and more alienated from these very, very tight restrictions of how they were supposed to see things. So uh, they, they just think, they thought they were taking artistic license, I guess, that they were going to broaden the picture. Uh, it's like, I, I used like Steve Jobs, you know, he said, um, you know, if he had, uh, he never took a marketing approach to his inventions that if he was going to design what people knew they wanted, he never would have designed anything innovative. That they were doing what they felt was, yeah. was innovative. I, I see your point. Right, right. They, I mean, they definitely could have refused as they, as Monty, as Monty Python makes fun of. They could have said, well, we're not going to pay you. Right. You know, we don't like it. But do you think that justified maybe, you know, killing them or? No. Them? no. Well, that's what would have happened. Yeah, right? Yeah. But, yeah. When they hired someone, but I see paint, your point. It's a good point. Yeah. When they hired someone to paint an altarpiece, do they just say, "Hey, paint it, and we'll see it at the end"? Like they don't go over the drawings that's or anything, or decide if that's going to fit there. Or that's that's I don't think <laughs> you know. That's a I, you know. I, I can't say I know. I, I don't know. Could you know. sort of repeat what he just said for the camera? Oh, I'm sure. Uh, the question was when these artists were commissioned by the church to do an important painting. What did they get to see? Studies that they. Were there any, did they get to see preliminary work so they knew what they were going to get? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I know, well, I do know with Michelangelo, he kept that in complete secret. Nobody was even a, a, allowed in the chapel, except for Pope Paul III, until it, until, it until it was unveiled. So he kept it in utter secrecy. He knew. He knew. So my guess is with Veronese, it probably was the same thing. He knew mm -hmm. that if he showed him what he was going to do, I mean, it's not going to happen. So my guess is they, they worked in secrecy in the church. I don't know. They just, in, the, in Veronese's case, they were in Rome. He's in Venice. And I, you know. Now I'm wondering on yeah. that paint, painting, the girl with the red balloon, there's a well-known children's book, The Boy with the Red Balloon, that takes place in France. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's oh, some sort of could a connection be. with There might that. be. I don't know. There might, there might be some. Could you just of, repeat what you said? For the camera? Oh, uh, yeah. You're saying with the with the Banksy painting, "Girl with the Balloon," is there a girl reference? Girl with the red balloon. You well, said. it's actually I, they call it "Girl with a Balloon." I thought it was "Girl with a Red Balloon." I, okay. I don't know which is correct, but um, you're saying there might be a reference to the French film "Boy." And it, it's yeah, a children's with a red book. It's a well-known yeah. the red, but the boy with the red boy balloon. Boy with the red balloon. I don't know the answer. I'm to wondering questions. if there's I don't a know. connection there. I really don't know. There could be. I don't know. Yeah, it's the girl with the shredded balloon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The yeah. shredded balloon. Yeah. What, I'm just curious, what if, what people's response to the huh. pussy riot? That's what I'm curious about. Nobody seems to have any, uh, oh. nobody has any thoughts on that? Because to me, that's the most controversial thing in here. Yeah. Sure. Um, if you look at their performances, oh, yeah. they're vulgar. Yeah. They yeah. will, they will put you, push you to the limits of whether you think this is, acceptable or not um so it's to me it's yeah well interestingly before the last presidential election they came out for trump and against hillary because they said hillary would be the old uh the old world way of doing things i didn't know that yeah so that was oh i did not know that huh. that's interesting could you just repeat what he said i got it Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's it. I did not, they, really, they came out in support yeah, of, exactly. I don't know they came like out in support that, of Trump or just not? No, it was not, just against Hillary. I said against Hillary, okay. Wow. What, why were only two arrested and put in prison? The third woman, uh, as, uh, had an, they, each, they all had attorneys, and uh, for, the, the attorneys were able to argue for the third woman that she didn't uh, actively participate. She was on the state, on the altar, but uh, she wasn't uh, doing anything, uh, really. She didn't get a chance to do anything. And that's how she got off. Whereas the other two women, uh, Nadia and, and so Masha... What were the actual charges that put them in prison? 
I think the official charge is funny. I think it's hooliganism. I think that's the, <laughs> the, the official charge that they were guilty of hooliganism. And uh, they faced up to, I think, I, they could have spent up to seven or eight years in prison. And the two years was considered very light because of the international protest. And uh, apparently they may have gone through some real heavy stuff while in prison. Um, but I don't, I, I don't know exactly what the details are. They don't talk about it. Um, yeah. I just think it's interesting how they speak to young people, how young people are just by the millions. Women all over uh, Eastern Europe now are being far more outspoken and demonstrating uh, because of that. So it's hard to say that they don't have some value. There's not some value to this. I question the use of profanity with any of this stuff. I, I think it kind of, uh, you, know, you kind of shoot yourself in the foot by going too far. Uh, but that's only my opinion. Um, but they're certainly reaching young people. Would they reach the young people without the profanity? Well, that's a good question. I, I think. Waiting for you to say that. I don't know. I can't answer. What do you? What do you? Anybody? Anybody? anybody what do you think? think? Part of their culture. I, I, think, I think. I think it draws the people, the young people, to them because it's the anger. It's the expression of the anger, yeah. and, of the and rage, the, and the rebellion. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's what, what it is. Like punk rock. The language. That's yeah. basically the appeal. It's yeah. expressing the rage, the frustration uh, against the system. Right. So, um, like Lenny Bruce, like, right? right? I mean, you could right. say Lenny yeah. Bruce was profane. You can have this argument, but did he did he do something of value? Was there a point to that profanity? Mm -hmm. That's a matter of opinion, you know. You can't. Uh, but I think I just again, I no matter what you say about them, I don't know where they get their guts, because yeah. Putin is not going to, you know. No. So, but thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. Staying for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.